the problem of evil, which is really the one of the central problems, of course, of any religion. But I would say especially the, the Judeo-Christian tradition has been obsessed with this. Those of us that have you know, had, had trauma in their lives or who have lived through uh, disasters, calamities, various kinds, you know, get, get into inquiries about what it's all about with regard to these uh, visitations of what we call evil. And you might define evil as that which hurts you, <laughs> that which causes pain is a very general, generic, but I think a good definition of evil. You know, not everything that causes pain is evil, but evil always causes pain, damage, anguish, um, anxiety, uh, and loss. And so, that, you know, those of us who, and pretty much anybody living on Urantia has, in, has had great losses and great adversity. Christianity made some big mistakes on this issue, but it also had some very important, uh, brilliant breakthroughs. So we're going to go through a history. So this, this is the cover of the book, and you can't see the subtitle, but the subtitle says, Toward an Integral Theodicy for the 21st Century. So that's part of the discussion. So we're going to talk about the problem of evil, but there's a need for what you might call an integrative theodicy, because theodicy is really the kind of the theory of evil. And theodicy is how we can grapple with the presence of evil in the light of the fact that God is infinite and all loving. So it's a great paradox in, in, in this discussion. This happens to be my mentor uh, at Union Theological Seminary. It's a guy named Roger Haight. Roger is a uh, Jesuit. Uh, Jesuits are open-minded these days in the academy. And he was, I chose him as my, my reader of my thesis, his master's thesis. And uh, lo and behold, he was confronted with the Rancha book. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he trusted me enough. I'd been in a couple of classes of his. And, he, and I said, look, I want to do a chapter on the Urantia book in my thesis. So he's like, well, what's that? <laughs> and this guy's written over 20 important books in theology. He's taught in all these great universities and seminaries. He never heard of the Urantia book. But to his credit, and I put him here because he read a lot of it. I gave him a, a sample, a, a copy, and he read it. And he, he came back and he, and, and he, after a month and he said, you know, <clears throat> I'm just too old to go through this, you know, take me a year, but, but I did read a lot of it. So he allowed me to write a chapter on, 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 on the UB. This is my other mentor, the other reader, Catherine Keller, very different sort of scholar who is very creative, cutting edge, Protestant uh, thinker, Methodist. And she has become fascinated with the Urantia book because of the fact that she read the thesis and uh, thought it worked, and since then has invited me many times to coffee to talk about what this thing is. And she she's remains interested, and she continues to be in touch often with me. Um, this is at Union Theological Seminary. Um, the guy on the left, uh, I, I would like to highlight this guy's name is Gary Dorian. He's with Catherine uh, Keller on the right. Gary Dorian is a historian of theology. Gary Dorian is the world's leading authority, probably, on the human sources of the Orange Book without knowing it. But his specialty is 19th and early 20th century liberal theology. And so over the months of working on, 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 on this, I, I've been in touch with him. Uh, he, I also took uh, courses of his. To let him know that this this book called the Rancher Book that has these human sources that he has written, you know, tomes about. You know, she's he's written a number of volumes on the liberal theologians, and he's a historian of that era. That the and those are most of the theological human sources. So I'm, I'm trying to get him to look at the UBS and done it quite yet. Um, so to get started, um, all of you, I'm sure, uh, uh, remember from your Bible reading the story of Job, the book of Job in the Old Testament. And 
I'm going to be using uh, William Blake's illustrations here in a few places. This is one of his famous illustrations, which I always wondered what this is about until I really did study uh, Job at that seminary. And Job had the big problem, which was that once he was afflicted, his friends who showed up to give him consolation, these three friends, all had bad theodicies. In other words, their explanation of the evils he had suffered were erroneous. And that's really what the book of Job is about, that these friends, so-called friends, did not provide consolation. In fact, they made him worse off because they said, basically, Job, if this is happening to you, it means you deserve it. And you have, you have created conditions for you know, the loss of everything. You know, here the wife is shown in, in the image because Blake put his wife back into the story, but he actually lost his whole family and all of his wealth and his health. And, and, and so the friends are saying, um, you know, kind of according to Jewish uh, so-called Hebrew, Hebraic sapiential theology, which was that if you're well-off and wealthy and happy, that's because God gave you those gifts in recognition of your good deeds. And that, that, that is an erroneous theodicy. Um, and we'll, we'll find out more about what that means. Um, two of the people that really grappled with this are uh, David Hume on the top. And uh, on the bottom is uh, Gottfried Liebdes. Uh, David Hume wrote this. It says, is God willing, in other words, it's a set of questions. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not evil? Then he is impotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? So as you may know, uh, David Hume is a famous skeptic. And in this particular text uh, became quite famous because he kind of threw down the gauntlet to the Christians um, around him in the 18th century saying, answer these questions for me. How, how can you do it? And I, I, he says, I'm a skeptic. I don't think you can answer these questions. Leibniz tried to do it in the 17th century, 18th century. Uh, he coined the term theodicy as theodicy meaning the answer to these questions. Um, and um, so this problem of theodicy is really, really much bigger actually than even in, in the earlier Christian eras because of the degree of evil that we have in the modern world that uh, once the World War II happened, theology had to had to change because <clears throat> our theories of evil and how God uh, God encompasses human evil tendencies had to change, particularly after the Holocaust. Uh, so this is the problem we call the problem, not just the problem of evil, but the problem of horrendous evil. So the earlier Christians didn't really have this category. I mean, they had terrible things like the Roman Empire, but they didn't have things like Hiroshima to explain. So how do you explain a deity that allows such things to happen uh, on the face of the earth and then say, well, this is an infinite loving deity. How do you explain that? That's the, that's the predicament of theodicy, especially modern theodicy. So, so just breaking this down for you again, um, uh, there are three apparently incompatible propositions here. One is that what we all believe, God is our sovereign, and is God is our all-powerful Father, Creator. Uh, that's the cardinal uh, belief, Christianity, your ranch book, Judaism, Islam. Uh, two, God is infinitely benevolent, just, perfectly loving. Again, another premise of our faith. Three, evil plagues our daily life and can prevail for long periods of time. So you can't really put these things together without a theodicy. And so, uh, so what kind of the upshot, I'm going to give you kind of a giveaway, what, what the final answer may be, is you have to ha practice apophosis, which is 
uh, a, a something that's in vogue now in, in, in theological study, which is we just don't know <laughs> that it's apophosis means it's unfathomable and there's a mystery of evil. However, we can go pretty far in explaining what it is about. So that's when we do rational philosophy, theology. We do as much as we can. We go as far as we can. We use the Bible and we use other texts to explain the presence of evil and to, and to pry, try to explain what God is doing for us through the incarnation of Christ, mainly. Uh, <clears throat> now, this word antinomic is... Is, is, is a word mainly from Eastern, Eastern Christian Orthodox theology, which says, it's a big paradox, people. And you can't really, you can't stop the paradox. You gotta hold, hold these incompatible propositions in mind. And, and that's where we get a, a kind of Christian mysticism, where we, we, we contemplate this, uh, this paradox and, and how God holds this uh, together. So our first task, uh, you might agree with me, I hope you do, is that we need to look at the Lucifer Rebellion and look at uh, the lessons of the Lucifer Rebellion. So the first task, distinguish true liberty from false liberty. You know, once you get older, you begin to see, you know, with your kids, you know, the behavior of teenagers and, you know, immature people, what the difference is. But here's some very advanced language of, for this discernment task. <clears throat> True liberty is progressively related to reality and is ever regardful of social equity, cosmic fairness, universe fraternity, and divine obligations. Liberty is suicidal when divorced from material justice, intellectual fairness, social forbearance, moral duty, and spiritual values. Liberty is non-existent apart from cosmic reality. Unbridled self-will and unregulated self-expression equal unmitigated selfishness, the acme of ungodliness, licensed masquerading in the garments of liberty is the forerunner of abject bondage. <clears throat> True liberty is the associate of genuine self-respect, false liberty consort of self-admiration. I Many can spend years on this passage. So I kind of break it down here a little bit and simplify. So the fruits of liberty on one hand is, you know, the true liberty leads to altruistic service, love and, and caring, consideration, compassion. And false liberty leads to some form of self-aggrandizement. In many cases, self-aggrandizers don't even know it. You know, they may be narcissistic and, and not even aware of it. So they, they remind you of these quotes, true liberty is the fruit of self-control, false liberty, the assumption of self-assertion. Self-control leads to altruistic service. Self-admiration tends toward exploitation, etc. So in, in the UB there, in part four, there are a number of discourses about evil and sin. And this one is, I think, the most helpful. I actually don't find the passages on Job as good as that. You know, it's a wonderful teaching about the book of Job, but I find this is a little bit more better, uh, more precise uh, language. Evil is the unconscious or untended transgression of the divine law, the Father's will. Evil is likewise the measure of the imperfectness of obedience to the Father's will. Sin is the conscious, knowing, and deliberate transgression of the divine law, the Father's will. Sin is the measure of unwillingness to be divinely led and spiritually directed. Iniquity is the willful, determined, and persistent transgression of divine law. By the way, I also use the word demonic uh, as, as interchangeable with iniquity. So this is a very strong uh, set of statements. So, so here's, here's a more systematic Statement about evil, which you can spend years just trying to contemplate this. <clears throat> the gods neither create evil or permit sin and rebellion. Again, the gods neither create evil or permit sin and rebellion. Potential evil as time existed in a universe embracing differential levels of perfection meanings and values. 
Sin is potential in all realms where imperfect beings are endowed with the ability to choose between good and evil. This is a wonderful philosophic statement that I did not unpack in the book. It's, it's really advanced uh, compared to anything I have seen in the history of this discussion. So here's where I kind of break this down into, a, into, a, into a, a, what I call gradations of moral descent. And if you put the UB statements together, you get really four levels, error, evil, sin, and iniquity. And so this is a descent into to the bottom of moral turpitude, as I call it. And there are uh, ways to, other ways to think about this, which I'll, you'll see in the chart. So in this chart, this chart is based on the UB, but it's my interpretation. In another part of the text, in part one, they talk about, in other places, the deity of reality, for example, they talk about the phenomenon of accidents. And according to uh, certain theologians, there are no accidents. Certainly, it's a tenet of sort of new age spirituality. Oh, man, there are no accidents. You know, everything means something. Everything. But the UB doesn't really say that. The UB says that there really are accidents and they're random. And, and so we have to put that in here because accidents are not evil technically. But once you get to error, um, you get, you're not evil, but you're on the way, but you're immature, right? And it's, pers I call it perspectival. Your perspective is immature. You are not evil because you made a mistake because you're a maturity lack of experience. However, if you don't correct your errors, you may go to the, you may descend to evil. Now, one thing really important for everybody to note about the Ranch book is that its definition of evil is really not colloquial. It's not really how we tend to think of evil. We tend to think of evil as really bad stuff. We tend to think of it as really sin. And that's because of the biblical background, especially the Western church. Just about everything that's bad, we call it a sin, right? Original sin because they're trying to demonstrate to you that you're a sinner, right? So they you know, so they, they don't distinguish evil from sin sufficiently. But the Urantia book does, and this is how I system, uh, schematize it. Now, evil is, in the UB, about being in conflict, where um, you don't say that an evil person, Urantia book doesn't say evil people are doing this on purpose. What it does say, it's that they're, they're sloppy, they're lazy, they, 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 know, they know better, but they just don't get around to it, but they're not intending it to be evil treatment. They're, but they're, 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 it's like manslaughter in uh, criminal law, right? It's negligence. So that's, that's kind of an interesting um, distinction that UB uses that I haven't seen too many places. But then when the UB talks about sin, then uh, we move across to, you can see the column there of deliberative. Sin is deliberative. Evil is not. Sin is deliberative. Sin is you knowing better, knowing it's wrong, and doing it anyway. You know, it's like Richard Nixon in the White House. I mean, he knew he was doing something evil. And he, you know, he, you know, the Watergate and all the rest was basic manifestation of people that were knowingly did this and they, and they were criminally liable for it. So of course, as you know, from uh, studying the Lucifer rebellion, iniquity is systemic evil. So I think that's pretty straightforward that it, iniquity has all these types of turpitude, so to speak. And uh, uh, so we must also distinguish sin from iniquity because sin is not systemic. Sins can be episodic. But iniquity is not. It's 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 a, it's a way of a way of seeing the universe. Uh, so now I want to introduce uh, the issue of the history of this problem, right? So the history of theodicy is really the subject of my research, and you may recognize that 
uh, that image above is made by Steve McIntosh, a ranch book reader who's really taken on this issue of the spiral of development. And the spiral of development in integral, so-called integral theory <clears throat> is what I'm using here. So there, there are three periods and it's pretty straightforward that early, anything pre-modern we call traditional, anything modern we call modern or evolution, anything post-modern sort of post-World War II we call postmodern or we uh, integral or integrated. So these are periods, but they're all related. As you see in that spiral, you transcend and you include. You don't just you don't just have you don't you don't just say, oh, everything in the tradition is crazy. It's all wrong. We're going to reinvent the wheel, and that that's really what we call new age, right? The sort of the California new age. We're throwing the whole thing out. We're going to reinvent this stuff. Reinvent you know, religion. And <clears throat> some of the Arantia movement tends to come out of that mentality, by the way. But the Arantia book is not uh, of that sort. The Arantia book is profoundly drawing from traditional biblical uh, sources, not just, of course, the human sources, but 60,000 cross references to the Bible, right? So we know from the paramony, the Bible is all over the place cross-referenced in the UB. So we, we traditional and modern come together in the UB. So the postmodern is harder to get at. And we're gonna do traditional, then we're gonna do modern, then we're gonna do integrative, and, and, and then we'll have Q&A after that. So, so I, I have these complicated academic phrases that I boil down to, to easy slogans. So these are, these are the, uh, sort of the chief slogans of theodicy from the biblical period up to the 16th century, probably up to the 19th century. So number one, the devil makes us do it. Number two, we're junior partners with God. Number three, free will leads to greater goods. Number four, it's all under God's control. Number five, all's well that ends well. So these are the five great ideas about evil and the solution to evil in Christian thought. By the way, they're all in the UB. So now let's break this down. So the first one, the devil makes us do it. So, you know, you those of you that come out of more of a Christian matrix know that there's this thing in the Bible of Christ versus Satan. So that's the first point. It's called the co cosmic conflict model of Christ versus Satan. This is what the theologians call this, that the model uh, has to do with the presence of Satan as the god of this world, very strongly stated, particularly by Paul, and Christ as the opponent. And uh, this model is actually very interesting and dramatic and beautiful in a certain sense, certainly dramatic. Um, and uh, this great guy named John Peckham is a systematic theologian modernized this. And John Peckham basically intuited what the UB says about this problem. And uh, I sent him my, my, my thesis. And we were supposed to meet each other at the uh, American Academy of Religion. But uh, he, in the end, he avoided me because it's, it's just too much for him to accept the UB, even though he, he kind of intuited what the UB says about the presence of the demonic on the planet. So he strips it of, of, of myth. And his, his basically the upshot is this, that there's a prior agreement with the devil, i.e. Caligastia, which allows him to remain on the planet even after the incarnation, even after the resurrection. Right, so that he said that must be the case because why would we still have horrendous evils, even though Christ came and brought salvation to the planet and deposed uh, the God of this world? How could that be? Well, that's basically what the UB says, and he intuited that. Um, so, <clears throat> certainly, uh, th this notion that the devil makes us do it is uh, is, is upheld in a sense in the UB um, in the Lucifer Rebellion. Uh, the problem with being a UB person, <laughs> if you're in seminary, Christian seminary, is uh, what's called neo-supernaturalism. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a term of derision among liberal theologians that you believe in like angels and, and you know, these, these demonic beings. But the Arantia book is kind of crazy to them because it re, re brings back this notion of demonic forces, fallen angels, as literally the case. And, you know, liberal theologians don't accept that. It's very rare. Uh, second one, we're junior partners with God. This is a kind of a funny way of saying a very important thing, which is that we are moving toward perfection, but we are junior partners. So we are not doing a new age thing where we're self-deifying, right? We're not doing it with pride. We're doing it with humility. We're approaching, but we have, we have the architecture, interior architecture, that we can choose the good. So that's why will is central in, in this view, which is more Eastern Orthodox. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll skip through uh, the rest of it, but uh, you all know, of course, that the Arantia book does depict us the way that this Eastern Orthodox teaching uh, about perfection, known as theosis, which is that we're becoming perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. That is a notion that does not really appear Western Christianity. It's 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 really set aside, but it does appear in Eastern Christianity, and the Ranch Book ratifies it. And so does Methodism, by the way, Wesley. Um, and of course, the Ranch Book establishes it by by saying God is within. God is also uh, as uh, to be contemplated at the center of all things at the same time. Just a little footnote, I wanted folks to realize all throughout the teachings of the UB on these issues, you find human sources. Like I found this, and some of you have noted that Luther is almost perfectly quoted in the UB in this teaching by Jesus in paper 143 about regeneration of the spirit. It's it's the notion of, of, right, of, of uh, salvation through faith. That's like right out of, right out of, a little bit out of Paul, but definitely out of Luther. This happens all the time, and this is part of Luther's theodicy. So here's the view that in tradition, we have the notion that all these awful things that may have happened to you will be turned around in the afterlife, right? So, so it, in the eternal life that Jesus tell, talks about in the New Testament, however, not everybody's going to get there. A lot of them are going to go to hell. And, and that's, that's kind of a problem for, for Christian thought all the way up to the 20th century. They still talk about this. So that's the individual's fate, but the collective fate is that it does end well because there's going to be the descent of the New Jerusalem at the end of the dispensation. dispensation. So what does the UB say? UB is absolutely fabulous for Christians or Christ-centered people, because it describes how we, how all is well, all that ends well, all that will end well on the mansion worlds. Because even if you were, you know, snuffed out in a terrible way, you can have total re rehabilitation, consolation on the mansion worlds. However, the UB has another subtlety, which is that some don't make it some decide not to survive. <laughs> and this again is the issue of horrendous evil, which I said at the outset, it's a key issue. So because of certain horrendous evils, some people who experience them will opt out. They will not get salvation. Um, we're, gonna return to, we're gonna return to that in a moment. Uh, now we come to the modern uh, view Look, uh, everybody, you gotta you gotta have mercy on Christians because the tradition had no idea about evolution until the 19th century. So they had a big problem, which is they did not have what we know about the Supreme. They had a static universe and they could not figure out a way to overcome evil other than the, the idea that God makes it right, more or less through, prede through predestination. But now in the modern era, we get uh, the notion of everything's evolved. 
Uh, second is the notion that God is not determinative. God doesn't control everything. God takes risks. So in uh, current theology, they've come to the UB view, which is, they call it open and relational theism. It's something new since the 1960s, 70s, that uh, they noticed that conservative theologians noticed that in the Bible, God doesn't always get what God wants. So how come we're saying God determines all things? It can't be right. It must be that God takes risks with the universe, and the UB ratifies that. Finally, is perhaps the, the supreme theodicy is that is soul-making theodicy. My last book, some of you have seen, is, is about this, and it's in the Christian tradition, latent. It's a, it's a minority view. It comes from Irenaeus, if anybody know from the third century, who said, you know, wait a minute, I think, I think we're evolving. We don't know exactly what that means, but we're growing. We're growing out of evil. But you know what happened? The Christians rejected that in the West. They said, we're not growing out of evil unless God delivers us. We can't do it by our own efforts. We have depraved wills. We have original sin. So only in modern times do we get this notion of soul making, if, uh, the full notion of that. And it starts with this guy named John Hick, but the UB also, of course, explains that. So now we're going to look at that. We're going to go back track and look at the first of these, which is everybody interested in this topic needs to know about process theology. If you've not come across it, it's the, the discovery that God evolves, very radical, nothing like this was ever really hinted until really the 20th century. So con, con, uh, at the same time as the UB, we get this teaching from Alfred North Whitehead. It's called process thought, process theology. Deity co-evolves with us. And then this guy, David Ray Griffin, took this even further. And that's where I get the word demonic that's in the title of my book, that there, because God is not able to stop every, these great evils necessarily, right? So tradition said God necessarily is going to stop evil eventually. But the modern evolutional view is it's contingent. It's real. And, and so the UB ratifies that. The UB says green being evolves as we evolve, and evil is relatively real. UB also says perfection and imperfection are in polar relationship to one another. Nobody thought about anything quite like that in the traditional view. And of course, the UB says that paradise deity can intervene anytime it wants. Um, there are slogans I have here in, in, uh, in, 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 in brown lettering that uh, evil is relatively real. That's a modern view. That is not the pre-modern view. That is not the biblical view. The biblical view is that evil is an illusion and God is able to harness it for good. But that's not this view. This view is that if we don't get our act together, we are not going to settle climate change. And we may perish from that or from nuclear war. And God isn't going to stop it because God is evolutional with us. So we must prevent these horrendous evils. You all know this quote, but let's read it together. If man recognized that his creators, his immediate supervisors, while being divine, were also finite, and that the God of time and space was an evolving and non-absolute deity, then would the inconsistencies of temporal inequalities cease to be profound paradoxes. Any honest being when viewing the turmoil and perfections and inequities of your planet should conclude that your world has been made by, managed by creators who are sub-infinite. I, I prefer to think of them as sub-infinite, uh, sub-absolute sub and perfecting, right? So Christ Michael is sub-absolute. Michael and mother are perfecting with us. This is a fabulous revelatory statement. This is, this is something that should bring peace to everybody, but it's also a call to action. 
Finally, it's the notion that God takes risks. <clears throat> this is, sounds crazy, right? Uh, God doesn't play dice with the universe. But actually, this is a view of modern theology that they had to come up with this in the light of horrendous evils like World War II, for example. So what they said was this. They, and they still have a thriving school of thought, which is that God creates structures in the universe that are unassailable for the sake of the whole. But God does not save everybody, every individual. Uh, and the UB ratifies that. It's hard to take this in a way because not everybody is saved in this worldview. For example, some minority group of Christians believe that everybody goes to heaven and has a happy ending. That's called universalism. But that's not the view of the Urantia. That is not the view of this school of theology. That is, that is the view of universalism, which is more or less a heresy in Western Christianity. They believe that some go to hell, <laughs> but nobody perishes totally. Nobody perishes totally. That's the traditional view. And that's still the view. You're either going to go to hell or you're going to go to heaven but nobody gets sort of snuffed out, so to speak. So let's read what the UB says. Providence functions with regard to the total and deals with the function of any creature as such function is related to the total. Providential intervention with regard to any being is indicative of the importance of the function of that being as concerns the growth of some total. So I'll leave it there. So the, the providence does apply to you, it certainly does. But the real overarching purpose of this is that it is guaranteed for the whole. And that is a major teaching of the Ranchable, that the whole is guaranteed to work, but the individual is not guaranteed to make it. So to wrap up, this is what we call integrative theodicy, so this is what I'm calling for. I'm saying that all of these fragments that we've been talking about have some truth all the way back to the beginning. Even the biblical view that, that the devil is present on the planet, that's partially true. I mean, it's really true, but it's not the only truth. It's, so, so biblical fundamentalists say, well, that's the main truth. You know, the devil is the god of this world. That's the main thing we've got to deal with. But the Rancher book says that's just one of the big truths. Caligastia and the, the Lewis Rebellion is not the only thing that's applicable in a theodicy. Uh, so what the UB is basically saying to us is all of this has truth. The entire tradition is, is full of richness. Do not divorce yourself from the Christian legacy, but notice that it's only partially correct in any one case, like Luther, for example is certainly right about many things. But guess what? Luther was really wrong in his view that everything's predestined, especially Calvin, right? It's all predestined. That's, that's just crazy. Not crazy, but it's wrong. Because those who believe that, which is latent in all conservative Christianity, believe that it's all determined by God. So the humans, human will is not really the key factor. So the second point here is, is Let's be multi-perspectival. This is postmodern era. We have to go for integration. And that's what the UB is doing in this, in this issue. The UB is showing us the way to the integration of the whole tradition, ancient, modern, postmodern. And I, I think my book shows that. It shows, for example, that point four here, there has to be a, the a cosmology that makes this thing work. Point five, a deity must be understood as both absolute and relative, that is absolute and evolutional. Deity is both, both poles exist, they subsist. And there's a relationship between us in the grand universe and the central universe. It's a dialectical relationship uh, that, is, uh, that is, solves a lot of the problems. 
So I'm just going to show you uh, the chart. This is the integrated chart. We don't have time for that. And, uh, but I, I show how all of it comes together in one uh, integrative unity in the Arantia book. Now back to Job. Job does get consolation at the end of the book of Job. How does he get it? Remember what happens to Job? His friends give him a bunch of bad theodicies. He falls into a deep depression. He starts crying out. And he gets a revelation at the end. Go and read the final pages. He gets a massive revelation at the end of the book of Job. And that's what we got in the Ranch book. We got a revelation about the problem of evil in the UB. And I want to end on this note. And Rodan tells us that we need to have a defense against evil from, from a union of souls. I'll let you read that, those quotes. And uh, that's why I've started this uh, entity called the Orange Book Academy. Uh, I'm not even sure that's the name. I'm just kind of suggesting this and beginning to work on it uh, to educate ministers uh, for, the, uh, for fostering religion. Um, and uh, we need to educate them in the way that we're doing here, which is what's the tradition, what's modern, what's Urantian, and how they blend, how they come together. Because the Urantian book is 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 a is mashing up these great truths into a higher truth. And uh, I think that would cover it. So let's do some Q and A. Um, Byron, I know you're a, a study for with epigenetics. And so this is this is kind of a cross pollination of your talents. Um, do our epigenetic modifications year in year out, generation to generation, make the the sort of Luciferian um, uh, manifesto and um, egocentric, uh, self centered, false liberty? Do all those things become more and more uh, difficult uh, because we are sort of systemically becoming? more tolerant of that self-centered, greed-based, uh, uh, everything is fine where it is kind of mentality? I think of uh, the epigenome, so-called epigenome, like this field effect of our decisions as they affect the underlying genetic inheritance. And um, the soul is like a, a, a field that contains that field. So there's a layering of fields. So the soul is, uh, you know, a marancha field that is uh, holarchically, that is, it embeds the epigenome. So that's a wonderful uh, area of study. And are we acclimating to the presence of evil? Absolutely. You know, I live in Washington, D.C., and we're, people don't even think twice about, oh, let's have another war, you know, and all right, so 300,000 people got killed in, in Ukraine. That's not so bad because we're weakening the Russians. I mean, I would call that, that's getting, in, that's getting toward a kind of an iniquitous view of things. They're not even noticing. Thou shalt not kill. I mean, it's just, and, you know, I walk around Washington, you can't find, you know, the activists here, the anti-war activists, they're very hard to find. So, yeah. Generally, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Uh, but, or Don has his hand up. You know, the Urantia book tells us that the individual cannot be influenced or affected by the devil against their will or even unknowingly. However, it doesn't tell us what influences an individual can have who willingly and knowingly embrace the devil and rebellion theology. And I have to wonder that some of the horrendous evils that we have experienced in this world were perpetrated by those who have knowingly and willingly embraced the devil. I mean, the term selling your soul to the devil is a very common uh, phrase. 
You also mentioned that the some of the evils that were existing, like climate change, are things that we are going to have to take care of ourselves. So with all that being said, do we have to take care of incarcerating the devil? Or is that something that God's going to step in and do? Good one, Don. <laughs> uh, so in the co-creative view of the UB, um, we are co-participants in uh, the demise of the Luciferic epic through prayer, certainly. But there's this sense that we have to earn it. Whereas in the Western theological view, we can't really earn grace. It is freely given to us. It's not contingent on our efforts because we can't do it. We don't have the, we have a deprived, depraved will. But the more enlightened view of Eastern Orthodox Christianity and of the Urantia book is that, yeah, we have to do our part of this. But if we don't, demonic power will grow and will lead to a planetary calamity, which seems to be imminent for many. After which, though, the Christian fundamentalist view is that yeah, it's the tribulation. God has a plan. Seven years of tribulation. Then God will intervene and solve the problem, right? So that's the primitive view. But our view is co-creative. So yes, the answer is we have to demand it, you might say, but we also have to show our desire for light and life, you know, through, for example, creating a world federation and abolishing war. UB makes that very clear. And uh, I think that Gar Jameson established in the last of, of this uh, spotlight series that, you know, that Emory Reeves is teaching about, writing about World Federation was, was imported last minute into the UB in the Urmila. So they put that in there and they were saying, you should abolish war. You humans should do this. You should end the nuclear threat. I mean, it's all implied in that. Uh, you should uh, do your job. We're doing our job. We're giving you incarnations. We're giving you the Bible. We're giving you the Urantia book. Now do your job. And if you don't do it, we'll let it go. But we'll intervene in, but not under the terms understood by conservative Christians. It's always going to be creating it together. So maybe they'll just work with the reservists. But there's enough reservists. Or, or, or a certain elite like us, you know, that take the reins, might be just enough. So that's why a lot is up to the Urantians, frankly. So a follow-up, where do we reach critical mass? Yeah, that's, that's for the divine to know, but there's pretty good theories about so-called emergent properties of evolution, that things... Evolution is getting to, you know, that a lot of people are saying, many people have theorized that a small minority can tip the balance, right? So very, you know, so, uh, you know, you can probably, you will probably see it if there is a huge revulsion after the Ukraine war and people get really serious about global law, abolition of war, reform the UN, throw out the UN chart, you know, that sort of thing. So now I forgot your question, restate it. Where do we reach critical mass for that partnership with the divine to incarcerate the devil? Well, the tears and prayers of the whole planet are going up to the divine. And, you know, certainly there's there's a response. And that, that led to the incarnation of Christ in the first place. Because don't forget, you know, the West is not totally wrong. I'm kind of down on Western theology. But the West is right to say that we earn the incarnation through, not through our efforts. But it was pure grace. Why? Because Luther Rebellion is not our fault. Luther Rebellion is an off-planet import of 
iniquity. That's not our fault. But we got messed up because Western theology said, well, God is not responsible for the fallen angels. But the Rancher book kind of says God is, in a way, responsible for the free will which allowed this to happen. So it's a very complicated debate. Uh, but I think the balance is that the UB says that deity, there are times when deity has to make a very unilateral gesture. For example, sending a magisterial son, like boom. Uh, but I don't think the magisterial son could come unless there's someone to receive the magisterial son. I think uh, Vincent was next. Did Lucifer, Adam, and Eve have a thought adjuster? Lucifer, Adam and Eve did not have thought adjusters. No. My point is this then. We have thought adjusters. We have the spirit of Christ. So I guess we're more culpable in some way uh, if we commit evil. In other words, we have some assistance that should guide us to say, don't do that. Um, we're here on Urantia, and this is somewhat has always bothered me. We're an experimental evolutionary group, people by the life carriers. We have the default of Lucifer, and we have the somewhat of a default of, well, a major default of Adam and Eve. This puts us in an environment where we have all kinds of pressures individually put upon us to, com I guess, to commit these things. Um, but one thought, and I'll, I'll leave it at that here, is that the function of a person is more important to father than the essence of the individual. Is this what I gather? Yeah, it's a complicated, good question, because I, I, I made a big point about that the function is more important than the uh, salvation of the individual. That sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? It sounds harsh. Put that in a society level. I mean, we uh, we would we'd have eugenics on a massive scale. Um, yeah. Well, just speaking theology here, not social policy, but theologically, the case is that the Urantia book is not universalist. People have to get that straight. And in, in this study of evil, evil sometimes does win out in the sense that certain very depraved individuals, like say Hitler, opts out of the universe, right? And, and maybe a pretty small minority, you know, important minority of Urantians opt out because they can't envision the goodness of God, even from the mansion lords. So what we have to conclude is that God guarantees the whole, but not the individual. However, God does everything for the individual that's possible. But it's not constructed that everybody gets saved. It's, it's a harsh reality. But what it really boils down to is that in Havona, everybody is good. Everybody's perfect. Down here, there's tragedy. Tragedy is built in. And it, it's, it, there's, there isn't an ultimate triumph until the end of the evolution of the grand universe. Until then, you're going to have treasure, you're going to have people like Hitler that do not survive, do not get saved. Tragedy not of our making, tragedy of those individuals who had a celestial responsibility to guide and to protect us and to educate us. and. We did not get the benefit of that. I hope there was mitigation, mitigating circumstance right. in, so, in, the, in the hereafter. I assume none of us are going to be sleepers in a sense that we do have an eternal function and that, yes, indeed, every bit of love, patience, endurance, given everybody a billion chances to progress yeah. will take place. Yeah, I, they, I believe that. Yeah, of course, but but in the in, in the technical sense, and it's important to get for your ranchers to get this, Hitler is gonna wake up and say, You mean I have to be up here and I have to confront the people that I snuffed out, six million Jews, etc., for the rest of eternity? I'd rather opt out. So, in other words, these are the tragic cases. 
And it's built in for a reason. Why? Because 1,000 times the good, uh, of 1,000 times multiplication of good comes out of the Lucifer Rebellion. Remember the quote? So God harvests goodness, even though individuals may not. 1,000 times. That's a crazy statement almost. Yeah. Thanks, Vince. I think uh, Christopher was next. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to get back to the, uh, you know, the evil topic, I guess. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I was the way I kind of I see it. You know, we're we're a planet that's gone into rebellion. We're not the typical situation. You know, on on the planets where the Adam and Eves get to, you know, are, are immortal and are guiding the planet, you know, through their evolution. And um, so, you know, it's not a typical situation here. We're we're, we're given a real big challenge in, in our situation, <clears throat> and. You know, with the free will, there's, you know, an inherent evil that can happen, right? And that's kind of the, the rules that, you know, on most planets, I'm sure it doesn't go that way because there is the parental, you know, presence there with them, with the Adam and Eve or, or the other presences. But I think what we're doing here and, and the purpose of, of experiencing this evil is, um, I'm going to call it um, a relatability. You know what our service that we'll be doing um, at some point in our in our universe career, um, we'll be helping along the other ascended beings. You know, so this 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 evil that we're experiencing and have to deal with, and if we come out of this and and do the career, we are very relatable to others who are uh, suffering in similar ways. Christopher, thank you, because what you're doing, you're doing theodicy. Right. You're okay. grappling, you're languaging it in your own way. Mm -hmm. I really encourage everybody to do. Uh, I'm kind of using more of the biblical language and trying to build on that, but you're using a, a slightly different language, and I really encourage that. Yeah, okay. because uh, just that don't, don't end up on one idea, because it's multiple, mm -hmm. it's multiple. For sure. What yeah. we call a meta theodicy is what is your answer book is provided. It's not just one, you know, for example, the no yeah, well, part. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we and we'll just keep on evolving and we'll be shedding our old truths for new truths as we evolve for the next billion years or whatever we do, right? But certain truths are enduring higher, for, higher, higher truths, I guess you could say. Higher truths, but they don't blot out the lower, the 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 mm -hmm. earlier. That that's the issue I find your rancher movement is we tend to Forget about the church. Forget about Christianity. We got something much better. We don't have to look, you know, I think it's a massive error uh, that, uh, that because the Rancher book is really a commentary on the biblical tradition for a reason, because the truths are there. Not only are they there, they have 2,000 years of experience with those truths that we should be uh, tapping into, and a lot of us just don't. Thanks. Uh, Marianne. I absolutely agree with you, uh, except the point that Hitler, there's even a possibility that he might be resurrected. Um, I recommend two books if they're still available. One's called Spear of Destiny, and the other is called Morning of the Magician. Yeah. And uh, they pretty much uh, lay out the whole plan. Uh, he, he was absolutely totally iniquitous. And in my, I have a theory that Caligastia, of course, was working with him to eliminate a very good gene pool. Yeah. So Hitler, but, you know, Hitler resurrects to the mansion world, number one, everybody more or less resurrects. So we call it, you know, so that's disputed. That's disputed, in, you know, interpretation. They, but then they get apprised of the situation in the afterlife. You're Hitler, you know, you killed millions of people, but we love you anyway. That's important. That's the salvation plan. Really. So he's forgiven. He's forgiven. Yes, he's condemned in the sense that the judges, but the judges don't settle it. The immediate judges do not settle it. It has to be, has to be a decision of the ancients of days. Right? So he, people are conscious. If they are eliminated, they are conscious and in front of yeah. the ancients of days. 
Yeah, I well, I mean, yes. they, they don't grow a soul that's transportable. Well, there's there's a little flicker of soul in everybody. You know, Hitler was good to his dog. He was good to his mistress. So there's a little bit there. But if there's well, nothing, if there's nothing, then technically you don't go to Mansonia one, right? But he thought a jester will leave if you okay. are so evil. And if you don't have a thought adjuster, how do you resurrect? How do you even get trans? How does the soul even get transported if yeah. there's no thought adjuster? Uh, technically, the thought adjuster would depart from that person, and they would not. They would not resurrect. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but but I think of God as more merciful than than anything else, so that would allow that because it would say, "This is how God demonstrates mercy <laughs> and you know and ministry, right, to even the worst of them." Because even Lucifer is going to be given, offered mercy, and we're already told that in the Bible, let alone the Ranch book. So they're going to offer mercy. And that but he accepted Jesus's mercy, right? But it was offered it. He was offered it, yes. Right. But, so but I thought you thing. said he was going to get it. Uh, no, he was offered mercy. He turned it down. So Hitler would be offered mercy, and then he turns it down, right? And and, and he's defiant to the end. So those people have the second death, death number two, right? This is death on the mansion worlds that they choose. They choose. The judgment is handed down. And then it says, well, you can do rehabilitation, Mr. Hitler. You know, you and all the rest of, you know, all of, all of your SS officers are all going to go through rehab. They have the resources to rehab, even the SS. They have it. But they say, no, we'd rather be snuffed out. Well, I so, guess we'll have history on the mansion worlds and find out. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, well, the UB tells us a lot of what's going to happen up there, so. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of time to ex find it and to accept it. It's hard to accept that some do not survive. Because it, it means that, that, that the, the, our universe is tragic. Ultimately. Not all are saved. And that's, that's not, not easy to swallow. Because it might even be someone you know who doesn't get saved. You're not going to have an eternal life with certain people. They're not going to make it. So I don't want to overstate this, but it is one of the truths, one of the many truths. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. So just a quick question, Byron. So do you think when they talk about the people who aren't repersonalized, do you think that's largely limited to sort of, you know, earlier in evolutionary state where there, where there weren't thought adjusters and they didn't have sufficient uh, soul built up and it would be, you know, it would be the... Uh, the rare exception nowadays? Yeah, I don't know about the early uh, cases, but uh, certainly these days, everybody has thought just or after Pentecost, you know, we have the whole you know, spirit of truth. So right. some redeeming something in everybody uh, in theory, right? And this is technical stuff right. because, you know, again, we're saying that Stalin was offered mercy in Mansion World. That's what we're saying. Mao was offered mercy. Right. Merciful God does that. But, uh, in uh, those without thought adjusters at all, no, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, David is next, I think. The Iranian, the, the revelators make it clear to us that it's not until the planet begin, begins to have individuals who are God-oriented that they are the ones who will have the ideals. The revelators make it clear to us that our political so-called elite, they're not elite at all, have a myriad of ideas, but are totally lacking in ideals. What we need is political leaders who have ideals. And that comes from spiritualness. I don't say, you know, that it's the spiritual that is the most important part of it. That is what gives you ideals. And you get the ideas from the ideals. Um, and I wish I could say that Iranians were a little bit more mature than they are, but uh, I would I would warn uh, Iranians to be a little more careful with the superiority complex that I kind of see running through there a little bit. Thank Thanks you, a lot. I appreciate it. David. I know in the uh, Urantia Book Academy that I'm starting over the next 20 years. 
um, I hope to be able that we can train preachers. I mean, in the best sense. I would like to have sermons like the one you just gave. I really, I mean that uh, as, as a compliment. And uh, we need to start giving sermons the way uh, pastors do, which means we need congregations. If we're going to have congregations, which I advocate, then we should apply the three-step method that Jesus established for a congregation. Remember that? Because it states that people will be sinning against you in your church, in your congregation, but this is how you settle it. It's a three-step method. Number one, you go to them and let them know what the sin that they, or what the offense was. If they don't hear you, you bring a witness. If they still don't hear you, you take them to the congregation. And the congregation decides whether to expel them. Sounds kind of harsh, right? But I think it's far superior to a study group where anything goes. We need study groups. But churches don't think that their Bible study is church. Bible study is down the hall in a certain room. But the church is where you fellowship, worship together, young and old not just middle-aged people. And your ranches need something like that. I wouldn't call it a church. I would call it assemblies. And uh, so that's where these kind of discussions should be held, which is what happens in Christianity. For example, in liberal Christianity, there's a massive discussion about politics, as you may know. Conservative Christians, you hear about it all the time. But liberal Christians are talking about war. They're talking about crime. They're talking all these things. And that's a category of theology called political theology. We need political theology in the Arantia movement. And actually, my next book's about that. Anyway, thanks for the comment. Christopher? That sounds like justice. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm doing some work here in, in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, um, in the justice system and, and trying to bring in some natural law with some, some people around. And... Uh, that sounds like it's very similar to what's described in due process and uh, the justice system. So the, the people I'm, I'm with uh, work on this are, are Christian. Uh, I'm, I'm pushing them, to, you know, to get into the Arantia stuff too, but uh, a little slow there, but um, yeah, it's just interesting. I think it's, I think that might be the grassroots movement, you know, having uh, these type of disputes settled in, uh, in a congregation of some kind, you know, that's, it. that's, a jury, right? That's the structure that, uh, yeah, anyways, that's, that just popped in my head as you were talking. So. Yeah, I've seen, <clears throat> I've got 50 years in the Arantia movement. You want to know how many study groups I've seen break up? Basically all of them. Oh, yeah, you need, you need justice con- built in there. Yeah, because of conflict. Because, But you know, study groups are not a congregation where you cannot resolve differences in the three-step method. Hmm. And that is why uh, what, that sounds like a very foundational element. Then that would need to be like, the, yeah, the root of it all, almost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, come out here to the East Coast uh, in the United States. I'm in Washington D.C. I'm the only known Urantia book reader in Washington D.C., for example. So you know, I think because we don't build the communities for worship and fellowship and socialization, we're we're not progressing. Mm. Mm. We're like a church that just has a, a Bible study. Um, Bob. The problem, so-called problem of evil, which is an inherent part of the design of creation in time and space, yeah. is not a problem merely for minds that lack a sufficient degree of spiritualization to see the purpose of that design to see the purpose of the fact that we're designed so that there is a differential between evil and good yeah. and you you begin to make distinctions about it that's how i would restate what you said so that's a mental philosophic right so that's what we call the problem of evil is a philosophic theological right. issue. that's what <laughs> your book is on isn't it that's the foundation of our, yeah. our, our sal- salvation in, 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 uh, in the sense that if you don't have the basic able to dis- ability to discern 
false liberty from true liberty, for example. Mm -hmm. You're you're not. That's an intellectual issue, and that's why we have this big fat Urantia book to make these distinctions. If you don't have these distinctions, it's going to be hard for you to receive divine grace in worship. Right. Which is why the Book of Job, most of it is a bunch of intellectual discussion about right. is this evil right and at the end, only at the end does joe get a a supernatural revelation only right. after he went through the process of the odyssey some of which were you know they were terrible but it's what we right. all did we're grappling with this until it we get somewhere with it and joe got somewhere with it because mm -hmm. at the end he goes my vindicator exists i just i can feel that from this discussion, but you guys haven't, you have not pinpointed, you guys being his friends, you've not pinpointed, but he gets to an opening intellectually where the heart can come forward and receive this, this statement that God comes out of the whirlwind at that point, but God doesn't come out of the whirlwind at the beginning. He wants so you to do yeah. some work, some homework, right? So yeah, you're right, it's a mental, operation to begin with and i don't think you get around that well that's what i mean you 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 make the point very clearly yeah. it is a process through which we grow by design in other words the so-called shadow land of evil is a function of a time space illusion and that we are using these illusions to learn and Job, obviously, as you articulated, utilized the variety of illusions that were thrown into his life to grow beyond them and to embrace the totality of a goodness that he embraced that transcended his own intellectual understanding. It was a function of of his faith that declared, I don't even care if you kill me, I will serve you. Uh, that's transcending the intellectual complexity of the so-called problem of evil. Yeah, this is the this is central to the debate, Rob, because th what I would call the facts of evil, so to speak. So mm -hmm. this is evolutional theology of the you know, 20th century, which says. No, evil is not an illusion. That's traditional theology. But I'm not saying modern theology is right. But I am saying that your answer book agrees with modern theology to the extent that while you're in the grand universe, evil is not an illusion. It is relatively real. So there are facts. You have, you have a holocaust on the ground. These people are dead, gone. Cities are destroyed. These are the facts. Those are facts. And, and to say these are not facts is a non-dual view, so-called monistic view of theology. And uh, I, I took that slide out of the, out of the presentation because, uh, but it's already present in Western theology. Yes. That evil is not real. It's an illusion. And God does all the work. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. God, God saves us through through His Son, right? And we didn't deserve it because we're depraved, and and these evils will be turned around by God for us. That's that's the the Western view, but the current view, the Urantia book does not it 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 ratifies that, but says it's partial. Because the other yeah. part it is that it's an evolutional universe where evil is relatively real. So you have to do both. You have to hold both. And that's this antinomy in antinomic theology. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, that, well, that's our, that's it. And that's the gift of uh, humanity is to integrate those two, the eternal and the temporal. And with that integration, uh, a supreme reality is emerging that is transcendent of any so called dichotomy of good and evil. It uh, is a wholeness. Uh, the wholeness of a goodness that's transcendent of any antinomy, uh, as you might call it, you know. 
It is in theory, but not in practice. No, that's, no. that's why we have evolution. We have the our, yeah. wor our worship embraces <laughs> worship embraces that, right? right? Better life ahead. And well, we'll not necessarily that, ahead. It's always present. Yeah. So that's the debate. This is the nexus of the debate, and what <laughs> I, I see. And the reason the Urantia book in the, in the foreword quotes this theologian, particular theologian, word for word, about uh -huh. perfection and imperfection. Remember that? Mm -hmm. the, you know, it's a harsh word. That they are coexistent, and you never get around it until, right. the, until, until the supreme is complete at the end of, of, of time. Uh, well, now that's that, that's true for the collective. Hey, guys, I, I don't want to cut you up, but we are a little past time, and I just want to oh. get Peter's one last question, and then we have okay. to uh, to stop. So, but thank, you, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah, uh, Peter. Uh, yeah, I mean, Byron, a uh, great book. I'm uh, 59 percent through it. That's what my Kindle app tells me, yeah. and uh, so <laughs> yeah. I'm begging it. But uh, you know, it just occurred to me when Bob asked this question just now. It turned into a little bit of a debate, which is cool, you know. But I've got. I want to know your thoughts on it, uh, Byron. Just, I mean, I, this is not going to be a debate for me, I promise you. But looking at the intent of the Lucifer Rebellion in the context of here we are on 606, uh, uh, an evolutionary planet, a decimal planet, meaning an exploratory or a, a, a experimental um, uh, evolutionary planet, was the intent sin? Oh. And if, if not, where did it start? Lucifer, you mean? Lucifer yeah. was operating in an evolutionary yeah. experimental environment. Did he sin? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the doctrine of the Urantia book says he does. So, you know, we can question that. You know, we can question it. Why not? But, but yeah, the, it, he was warned. He was told, you know, then they came presented to him. Gabriel gave the, you know, the alternate view, which was the official view, right? So he rejected this and he was offered, you know, that on and on and on was offered mercy right up until the crucifixion still offering mercy. He's still spurning. He's being presented with the fruits of sin in, uh, even in the cross. Okay? So if that's not enough, that means he's cosmically insane. Really. I mean, to be harsh about it, but that, you know, he's disappeared really in a cosmic sense. His, his, so that that is what iniquity is. You become non-existent. So he might as well be non-existent. So it's just a matter of the ancients of days saying, uh, you're out of here, Lucifer, because you have no repentance in you. Because somebody has to make the decision, right? So Bryce Michael doesn't make the decision. Ancients of days are the only ones qualified to make the decision. Uh Great discussion, uh, great presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Byron. Uh, uh, we really enjoyed it.